Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome, Genies, to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. I am so excited to have you here this week. We're going into a new season, and we've got Heather Mayo Smith back. Now, that name may ring a bell with you because last year she was on 60 Minutes talking about how she was interviewing Holocaust survivors, and they had set up some technology whereby people could actually have a conversation with this hologram recording of these individuals. Well, this technology is now being made available for all of us. You're going to want to hear what they're doing, how much it costs, what it does, how it works. You're going to love this coming up in about 10 minutes or so. Then later in the show, I'll be having a conversation with an adoptee who made a remarkable discovery about his birth dad. You're going to want to hear this. Hey, and don't forget, by the way, we're now offering great courses on our brand new website, ExtremeGenes.com, so you can sign up to learn the basics of genealogy or genetic genealogy. Yeah, how to work with those DNA matches. What do they mean? How can they help you out? So check it out at ExtremeGenes.com. But right now, let's head out to Boston and David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Hello, David. Hello, sir. How are you? I am awesome and uh, very excited to hear that you're getting your shot on the Wiki Tree Challenge. Yes, on <laughs> September 15th on Wednesday, I will be on at 8 p.m. Eastern. And this is on Wiki Tree Live, which you can watch, what, on YouTube? Where is it? It's on YouTube. All right. Yeah, I'm really excited. They did such a great job with you. I was excited when they had asked me to be a guest, and I'm hoping that they can uncover some things. I normally don't do your grandparents, but in the case we know about my dad's father, well, he is my brick wall. Disappeared in the 50s and still don't know where he is. Isn't that bizarre? And he was the criminal, right? He was, yeah. But he had been kind of clean by that time in his life. He was a little older. But he just kind of faded into history. And I know that he'd be 134 years old, so he's probably not going (laughs) to knock on my door anytime soon. But maybe they'll find him. Absolutely. Well, speaking of somebody knocking on a door, what an amazing phone call this guy Hudson got about his father. That's right. George Hudson took a 23andMe DNA test because his wife had asked him to. And he says, I don't know why I was doing it, but he took the test. And what he found out is he was 95 percent English and Irish. And he had some other potential distant cousins. Soon after, he heard from the Navy, was he the son of Charles Hudson? And he said, yes. See, Charles Hudson Fish died nearly 80 years ago at Pearl Harbor on the USS Oklahoma. Oh, my gosh. They've identified another one then. They did. Wow. I think this is a wonderful thing. George is 82 years old, so really didn't get the chance to know his dad. And as of late, he's had some health issues. So it's really nice to get some closure on his dad. Unbelievable. He was just a little kid at the time, so we never really knew him. What a great find. There are also some great finds going on in England right now. Actually, back in 2018 and 2019, there were over 31,000 burials excavated as part of a rail link work in London at St. James burial ground near Houston Station. And now they're looking for people to help transcribe the digitized burial records of over 57,000 Londoners who lived there in the 18th and 19th century to try to figure out who these people are. Oh, wow. You know, DNA is an amazing thing. And as we've learned, it changes how we think about our own cultural identity. And this is the case as an article that was on NPR, where they looked at the census of 2010 and compared it to 2020. For instance, one of the questions is, some other race and white. Now, 2010, there were 1,741,000 individuals in the U.S. that claimed that ethnicity. In 2020, Fish, the number changed from 1,741,000 to 19,316,000. Wow. I don't think that would be possible, even in the biggest baby boom possible. Right. So something has changed. And obviously, low price DNA tests. Yeah. For instance, another one, American Indian, Alaska Native, and white. In 2010, it was 1,432,000. 
in 2020, 3,968,000. So yeah. almost two and a half million individuals identifying with Native American. That DNA test changed the outlook of many people who probably weren't even genealogists, believe it or not. Interesting. Yeah, they thought they were going to get just the percentages in Ireland or Germany or even within a tribe or something within the United States. But this is a remarkable thing about how people self-identify now. It really is. Well, you know, they may have found your fourth great-grandmother in London, but they found somebody's, well, probably 1,000th great-grandmother on an Indonesian island of Sulawesi. There is a lost lineage that's now been found with the remains of a 17- or 18-year-old skeleton they found that dated back 7,200 years ago, who they're calling Bessie. And it is the only known skeleton of the Toalean people from Asia, which were some of the earliest to leave Asia to go to these Indonesian islands. That's insane. So 7,200 years back, and now they're saying this is a, a whole new human line? Correct. They had never found any survivors from this original migration until now. Unbelievable. You know, I always say that some people are silver-tongued, and that's a great English phrase. But in Egypt, a Greco-Roman burial, it's really a lot of burials this week, yeah. was found with a person with a gold foil amulet shaped in the form of a tongue placed in their mouth, essentially a golden tongue. And this basically was used for allowing the deceased to speak to the Osiren court in the afterlife, Osiris being the god of the underworld, and it would have been considered vital for people to have a way to speak with him. So, a golden tongue. That's incredible. What a find. I think so, too. Well, that's what I have from Beantown, but I'll be back for Ask Us Anything in just a few moments. All right, David. Thanks so much. Coming up next, we're going to be back with Heather Mayo-Smith. We had her on like a year and a half ago talking about what she was doing to record the experiences of Holocaust survivors using a technology that allows people to interact with the holograms of these individuals. Well, the technology has now been made available available for all of us to tell our stories and have our descendants ask us the questions. You'll hear what she's doing, how it's working, coming up next when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Unknown Parentage, Lineage Society Membership, Building Your Family Tree, Leaving a Legacy. Regardless of your reasons for hiring a professional researcher, Legacy Tree Genealogists can help you discover your family's past. Their genealogists are highly rated in their field with specialties in DNA analysis, historical context, and forensic genealogy. For nearly 20 years, Legacy Tree Genealogists have created thousands of professionally bound and digital reports for families like yours around the world. So whether you've hit a brick wall in your research or are just getting started, Legacy Legacy Tree Genealogists can help you tell your story and preserve it for generations to come. To receive a free estimate for professional research, visit LegacyTree.com or call 1-800-818-1476. That's 1-800-818-1476. We'd be happy to talk to you. Legacy Tree Genealogists. Genies. Ancestry.com has just released an important new database, and it's free. It's the Freedmen's Bureau Bank Records and the Freedmen's Bureau Marriage Records. These records are a game changer for African American research. For the first time, searches for ancestors among these records can be done solely within these two databases, making discovery easier than ever before. Every name in these mostly post Civil War records has been indexed. We're talking three and a half million names, and they often include the names of parents, siblings, children, former slaveholders. They commonly provide ages, marriage information, and so much more. In some cases, you can read in their own words some of their stories as well as their post-emancipation ambitions and challenges. If you've been hesitant to seek out your African-American ancestors because of the pre-1870 research challenges, now is the time to see what information is waiting for you right now for free. Only at Ancestry.com. Hey, Genies, it's Fisher here, and my shiny new ExtremeGenes.com website has been described as having that new car smell. I love hearing that. 
Having been with you for over eight years now, it felt like time to help out listeners and followers who need to know the basics of genealogical research, as well as how to understand your DNA test results and to be able to put them to work for you breaking down brick walls, identifying birth parents, locating new cousins who may have photos and information that can't be found anywhere else, and verifying your paper trails. Yes, DNA can do all that, and I can show you how. Check out the all-new ExtremeGenes.com website and download the free Genealogy Strategy Roadmap and the free DNA Starter Guide. Then if you like what you see, you can take those next steps to sign up for the video courses that you can watch at your leisure. I'll take you through all the basics, step by step. Find out more now at ExtremeGenes.com. All right, we're back. It's Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And it was about a little over a year ago that I first met my next guest. She is Heather Mayo Smith. She's with a little project called Story File. And we, the future dead people of the world, really need this. <laughs> and uh, hi, Heather. How are you? It's great to have you on. I'm great. Thank you. It's so good to be back. I first ran into Heather by watching 60 Minutes over a year ago, and my wife is saying, you got to get her on the show. And <laughs> and at that time, of course, you were working with the Shoah Foundation over at USC, and you were interviewing Holocaust survivors in hologram form so people could then ask questions of the hologram, and then they would respond with the answer. And mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time talking about this, Heather, and it's come a long way because now it's evolved to the point where anybody can actually talk and do the same type of thing with story file. Yes. When I was traveling around the world with the Holocaust survivors and getting data from them and questions and introducing the concept to people, the number one question I got was, can I do this myself? Right. And I think you and I talked about this a bit on your last interview. So finally, I got the point, you know, I can't, I can't, <laughs> <laughs> like, ah, OK, <laughs> there's a market so here. It doesn't need to hit me over the head with a bat. But it needed to be automatic. So it needed to be online. It needed to use the tools that everybody had. It needed to use the phones on your camera or your laptop and your computers and things like that. It needed to be online. And for that all to happen, we needed a little more infrastructure built and now with 4G and then 5G obviously coming out, the streaming has just been yes. exponentially better for upload and download. And the speech recognition has been so much better. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you hit your Siri button on your Google ASR, it actually understands you now. Sometimes. So we, <laughs> <laughs> so we needed all of that to step up a bit. Sure. And then we started to see that happening in 2017. So 2018, we started a company called Storyfile. The vision was that everybody on the planet would have their own story file, which lets people record the story of their lives, but it allows other people to interact with you and ask you questions and have a back and forth and have a conversation. And when we talked, you were in the beta mm -hmm. stage for this whole thing. Right. It's come a long way. We've had amazing people trying it out, testing it out, talking to us, giving us their opinions and their ideas and just going back and forth and iterating it. And it's now at a point where we are actually going to be launching it officially on October 4th. Oh, wow. But if you're listening to this before October 4th, you can go on storyfile.com slash life and you will be able to try it out yourself. Oh, wow. So it's like a beta for us. Yes. Yeah, well, this is good. Now, when you say try it yourself, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. there are going to be questions and, and a little technical mm -hmm. setup. Tell us what we'll have to go through to make that happen. So we've tried to make it as completely intuitive as possible. We want you to feel like you're on FaceTime just talking to your family. When you go on the site, it takes you through a kind of a tutorial first if you want to watch that. There are some tips and tricks. There's other blogs and things like that. But essentially, you don't really have to do any of that. <laughs> you could go just to re the recording and it prompts you with a question. You hit record and you answer that question. And then when you're done, 
you hit the button again and it stops recording. Wow. It, everything is done automatically. If you go in, you spend a half an hour or 40 minutes. The free script right now is about 30 to 35 questions. Finish all of that and you can go right into actually talking to yourself. So you can go back into that, <laughs> interact with yourself. And ask yourself all of those questions and see how it goes. Then you can share it with your family. You can share it with your friends. You can put the link to it on your Facebook page. You share it on social if you want. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. There are a total, though, of 1,621 questions. Oh, my gosh. Now, I, I know everybody's screaming, how much does it cost? <laughs> What's the cost here? So how does this work, Heather? Well, it comes in batches. So if you purchase 75 questions, it's $49.99. And then you can either purchase batches of 75 or you can just do a one-time buyout for $4.99. And that gives you the uh, ability to answer every question you want to answer. Wow. You can do it over time if you want. It gives you a certain amount of storage as well and you can also record at a higher resolution okay so it depends kind of how you use it but some people might want to do this and if you don't use all your storage and things like that you can do the same script multiple times oh, so wow. you can do this at 18 when you're going to college and then you can do it again when you have a family <laughs> You can do it again when you're 50. You can do it again when you're 65. So it can capture all of those points in your life. But what we're really trying to do here is, and you've talked about this on your podcast, your radio show all the time about DNA and finding your family history. And you and I talked about this before as well. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could talk to your great, great grandfather? You can find documents, you can trace yep. your family history, you can create your whole family tree. Well, what if now you're going to be able to actually go to that tree, you're going to be <laughs> able to leave your story file, and everybody on your tree is going to have a story file. And each one- Oh, wait a minute. Does this just mean I have to dress up like my great-great-grandfather or something? No. And tell his no, story? I, go, I guess I could though, right? You could, you could. <laughs> we want to keep it authentic. It preserves what you've said, your stories, in your own words, right. forever. Well, I've yeah. always maintained that we're living in somebody else's past, right? Yes. So, I mean, I'm not going to know my second great-grandkids, but right. I would love for them to be able to talk to me. Yeah, that's the whole key. We all have a past, and everybody that has lived before us in our families has added to our own identity. Yep. And what we hope to do in each lifetime is just add a little something to that story as it goes on. Yeah. Storyfile allows you to leave it in your own words so that people can actually get to know you and get to know the stories behind the documents, behind the photos, behind the, the little videos that you've left and get to know family members that they haven't been close to. So they wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just, it's unbelievable. And you have a free offer on this too. Yeah. So the first 30 to 35 questions are free. And what we want is just people to try it out for themselves. Then you can go back and talk to yourself and share that with people, get people's opinion and then do more if you want. I make a living talking to myself all the time. So this is, this is good. I'm really looking forward to it. You got so, a lot of practice. You're going to be great. You're going to be fine. You can, you know, you can answer this question. You can re-record. You can go through the questions beforehand, get a sense of what you want to say. Think about it a bit if you want to. So if one of my descendants wanted to ask me a question, do they have a list of questions that they can ask me? Do they see that? They can see that if they want to. Okay. Yeah. It, there's a little button on the side. It's in the lower left-hand corner, and it says hints on it. If you open that, if you click on that or hover over it, it'll open. And all the questions that that individual's answered under every single topic would all be there. Okay. But what we're encouraging, obviously, are natural conversations. So we want people's curiosity at any given time to kind of lead the conversation. So all the questions are not standardized then. You could ask something unique to that individual. Oh, of course. So sure. I tell people about my experience when I was a kid of getting to meet Jackie Robinson. 
So right. if one of my great, great grandchildren said, well, tell me, great, great grandfather mm-hmm. about meeting Jackie Robinson, how does it pick that up? What's the technology okay. All right. that would so, cause me to answer that question? Well, well, OK, so one, you're assuming that that child knows that you met Jackie Robinson. Maybe. Yeah. So they either ask it, tell me the story about meeting Jackie Robinson, or they ask a question like, who is the most amazing person or the most exciting person you ever met in your life? Okay. And you tell that story about meeting Jackie Robinson and what it meant to you when you were a kid. And that story would come up. It would pick it up from what? Is there something we connect to the question ahead of time? Well, it's all in the AI training. That sort of question would come up in, tell me a story about your childhood. Tell me a story about the most exciting person that you ever met. Different things like that. And you could probably have different stories for each one of these answers. Yeah, yeah. If they didn't know about Jackie Robinson and that story, those are the types of questions that they would ask for you to tell that. Different new iterations of Story File Life We've already planned out the next three iterations of it. And one of the next ones, you will be able to add your own questions. Oh, wow. If you add your own questions, like let's say your kids know that you tell that story a lot and they love that story. What they're going to do is they're going to add that as a question. Tell us the story about meeting Jackie Robinson. And you're going to go through it and you're going to tell that story about meeting Jackie Robinson when you were a kid, just like you would do at every major holiday dinner party <laughs> that you had and your kids have heard it a million times. Oh, boy. She is Heather Mayo Smith. She's with StoryFile. And I would imagine that you go to StoryFile.com, Heather, to try it out. Yes. StoryFile.com slash life, if you want, or just StoryFile.com. It's so great to catch up with you again, and I'm really excited what you're doing. This is a game changer, and I wish you all the luck in the world with it. Oh, we're truly blessed. So it's going to be an amazing thing for so many people to have these stories and have these people still in their lives. And speaking of finding an interesting past, wait till you hear the story of one adoptee who found out all about his birth parents. Coming up next on Extreme Genes. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And, you know, this whole idea of finding out who you are is so universal in all of us, but never more so than for people who have gone through adoption. And so many people we've had on the show have talked about that desire to know about the birth family. And sometimes it turns out great. In fact, I would say most of the time it turns out fabulously for the adoptee to discover their birth family. But once in a while, you find some surprises and things don't turn out that well. I've helped some people where I've said, look, I've got a phone number. But once you open this door, you can never close it again. Are you prepared for what might happen? And some people will say yes, some people will say no, and kind of go from there. And on the phone with me right now is a man in Phoenix who listens to us on KTAR 92.3 FM, Grant Ringuet. And uh, Grant, you've been through this process. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, sir. You were adopted uh, at birth, I assume, right? I was adopted at birth, yes. I was born in uh, Chicago, Cook County, Illinois in 1958. And I um, kind of knew about 12 or 13, something wasn't right. Um, I do have an adopted sister and an adopted brother. And we all had different mannerisms. It just, I don't know. But uh, when I turned 18, my father gave me my original adoption papers, which gave me my biological last name, Tomanek. Was this the first you knew for sure that you'd been adopted? I mean, I kind of knew, but my parents were very nice. And uh, they let me know that, yes, you are. You are adopted. But they really wouldn't give me the records until I was 18 years old. And so you found out your your birth name was what? My biological last name was Tomanek. Tomanek. And so it's an unusual name. Hey, it's not Smith, right? (laughs) No. (laughs) And so you wanted to go to work finding out if you could locate uh, your birth parents. Right. I was about, I don't know, my mid-20s when I really decided to, I don't know, think about it. So I happened to be in a hotel in Chicago on business, 
And uh, I looked in uh, a White Pages phone book, which they had back then. They didn't have internet. Sure. Sure enough, there were four names, Tomanac. And so what did you do with that? Uh, I found um, what I thought was my parents' name in the phone book. There was only four listings for Tomanac in the phone book. I called the one that I thought was my parents, and I reached what I thought was my father. A man answered the phone and said, you know, hello, how are you? And I said, my name is Grant Ringett. I told him my birth date, and the next thing he said was, what do you want? Oh, boy. Yeah, and I said, I don't want anything. And that that's when I knew that uh, he was my father, when he said that. Yeah, that's right. That's kind of a confirmation, isn't it? Yeah, kind of. Now, was he married to your mother at this point? Yeah, they had been together all their life. And why did they give you up? He told me that um, he spoke German, and, uh, and, you know, they had a bad look on people who spoke German. Oh, I so. see. So he was having economic troubles at the time. Absolutely, yeah. And so you spent one day with them, and how did that go? After I talked to my father and he hung up on me, later I called back, and I called back the same number, and it was my mother. And when she heard my voice, she started crying. She said, oh. I've been waiting for two weeks for you to call me back. She was afraid yeah, maybe she'd she lost you again. again. Yeah. As it turned out, a couple of days went by, but um, I guess she had talked to my sister, who I didn't even know existed. And my sister called me and said, hey, can you come to Chicago? I'd like to meet you, and I'll take you to our, to our parents, and we can talk about things. So I went to Chicago. I spent the night with my sister. We talked a lot that night, and then I went and met my parents that next day. And so how'd that affect you to, to meet them? Well, it was a shock. I mean, you know, it's, I kind of filled the hole, but needed to fill it more. It wasn't what you'd uh, hoped, right? No, it never is. Yeah. <laughs> Never is, but I'm, I'm glad I did it. But there was a bigger shock that you discovered as you got into this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my father told me that uh, he was a POW in the United States. From Germany during World War II. Right. And I didn't think much about it. And, you know, okay, whatever. And then uh, talked to them, found out what I wanted to know. I felt like I filled the hole. We're going on to about 20 years later, and I started thinking about it. I wanted to do some research. So um, I sent some letters out. I sent one to the National Archives in Berlin. I sent one to the International Red Cross. I got his actual POW number and found out that he was in the Luftwaffe. He had uh, gone to a flight school in uh, northern Holland in 1943, well, actually 1940, and uh, ended up uh, serving in Italy and then in Tunisia. Wow, that's quite a record. Yeah. But the and, Luftwaffe thing, that, that's, uh, that's problematic, isn't it? Yeah, actually, it was uh, formed in 1936 by Hermann Goering. So I believe he was a Nazi. So your birth father was a Nazi? I'm 90% sure. And I can quote from this. He was in a Luftwaffe Jagger Regiment Brethren, hastily formed from diverse elements, airborne engineer troops from employment in Tunisia following the, air, following the Allied landings in Morocco and Algeria. And so when, when did you discover this, Grant? Um, I did a lot of research. After um, There's an um, archive in Berlin called WASP, and uh, their records were limited on my father, but they gave me his regiment and his battalion and his rank and uh, where he was captured. He actually was captured in Porta uh, Fiata in uh, Tunisia. How did that affect you, to get, to get that news? I was a shock. I was overwhelmed. You'd known for 20-some-odd years that he'd been a, a, in the German military during World War II, as virtually all males had to be at that time. But well, yeah, he, he actually, you know, we had some intimate discussions, and he told me that uh, the truck came by his mother's home and uh, pretty much, you know, took him away and said, you're in the German army. So do you feel he was actually a party member, or are you just feeling that, that he was kind of forced into service, which was dominated by the party? I think the later. I know that um, he was in Tunisia. The British cut off their supply lines. They ended up um, at Torre Fiata, which is, uh, they had nowhere to go. The sure. The Mediterranean was north, and the British cut, cut off all their supply lines. They had no ammunition, no fuel, so they gave up. What would you say to people who are in your situation? They have that curiosity, that natural desire to know where their bloodline came from. And you went through that door. You, you know, as we say, sometimes you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube once you know 
Would you rather you've never found out or has this strengthened your ties with your adoptive family? What's been the effect on your life? Oh, no, I'm, I'm very happy with what I did. I love history. And this was, you know, I actually um, got a hold of the International Red Cross. who sent me uh, a couple of his POW cards. I have these. I have two assertions of these. And, and he had filled them out? I have his writing here. Yeah, he filled them out. They're from 1943. And, you know, I always maintain that the autographs and things like this, they're time capsules from that moment. What an incredible thing to have. Absolutely. And so all this has kind of been a a lovely education for you, something you just don't get from a school book. No, not at all. I did find my um, paternal grandfather, grandmother, my maternal grandmother and grandfather. I can't find a whole lot more. Because I believe the war, there was so much destruction. Sure. That, uh, yeah, I was pretty much decimated. A lot of the records lost. Well, Grant, an amazing story, and I so appreciate your reaching out to us to share it. I'm delighted with all the success you had in finding him and his records and, and how it's kind of filled a hole in your life and also strengthened your ties with your adoptive family. It has, and I'd, I'd like to thank my, my mother, my adopted mother, who... They didn't have a problem with me finding my natural family, and I I can't say enough for her. That's a great story. Thank you so much, Grant. You're very welcome. Wow. Talk about you never know what you're going to get, right? (laughs) Well, coming up next, we've got another round of Ask Us Anything as we answer your questions. David Allen Lambert will return from Boston for it when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Anytime is a great time to learn more about your family. Did you miss Roots Tech Connect this year? It's not too late to experience Roots Tech classes, keynotes, and how-to content. Just visit RootsTech.org to see what you missed and to experience Roots Tech Connect on your own timetable. Select inspiring and insightful messages that will help you in your pursuit to connect with and share your family story in new ways. You can then use the free resources found at Family Service Search.org or the Family Search Family Tree app to have a deeper personal experience getting to know your family, past and present. Connecting with family and learning about your ancestors provides healing, peace, and a sense of belonging. And it's easy to share what you learn with others to help and inspire them as well. Visit RootsTech.org for some inspiration or visit FamilySearch.org to continue on your journey of family discovery today. Hey, Genies, it's Fisher here, and my shiny new ExtremeGenes.com website has been described as having that new car smell. I love hearing that. Having been with you for over eight years now, it felt like time to help out listeners and followers who need to know the basics of genealogical research, as well as how to understand your DNA test results and to be able to put them to work for you breaking down brick walls, identifying birth parents, locating new cousins who may have photos and information that can't be found anywhere else, and verifying your paper trails. Yes, DNA can do all that, and I can show you how. Check out the all-new ExtremeGenes.com website and download the free Genealogy Strategy Roadmap and the free DNA Starter Guide. Then, if you like what you see, you can take those next steps to sign up for the video courses that you can watch at your leisure. I'll take you through all the basics, step-by-step. Find out more now at ExtremeGenes.com. Unknown Parentage, Lineage Society Membership, Building Your Family Tree, Leaving a Legacy. Regardless of your reasons for hiring a professional researcher, Legacy Tree Genealogists can help you discover your family's past. Their genealogists are highly rated in their field with specialties in DNA analysis, historical context, and forensic genealogy. For nearly 20 years, Legacy Tree Genealogists have created thousands of professionally bound and digital reports for families like yours around the world. So whether you've hit a brick wall in your research or are just getting started, Legacy Legacy Tree Genealogists can help you tell your story and preserve it for generations to come. To receive a free estimate for professional research, visit LegacyTree.com or call 1-800-818-1476. That's 1-800-818-1476. We'd be happy to talk to you. Legacy Tree Genealogists.
All right, we're back for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, David Allen Lambert, back over there from Boston and the New England Historic Genealogical Society, AmericanAncestors.org. And uh, David, this comes from Pam in Little Rock, Arkansas. She says, guys, how do I give sources for family stories that I have only been told by other relatives through the years? There are no records. That's a good question, Dave. Well, you know, it's interesting because I have some family stories that were passed on to me by my grandmother. Now, she died when I was 11, so I didn't have a lot of time to get more specifics. So a lot of them I couldn't find. I mean, there were stories that, like, how her father lost his hearing. You know, I mean, that's great, but where am I going to find that in the newspaper? You know, so a lot of times I tell people that, you know, don't give up on these stories because there may be an ounce of truth on me. And why would my grandmother lie about her father's hearing loss from a building being collapsed nearby? But write it down. I always say put a story at the end of all your genealogical facts. If it fits into the timeline of the story you're writing and then footnote it. And that footnote can be as simple as. I heard this story when I was eight years old by my grandmother sitting on her front porch. That's my version of it. So certainly, Dave, you've heard enough through the years to know for a fact that your grandfather was hard of hearing. So it would be easy enough to say, well, according to aunt so-and-so or grandmother, this was around the time he lost his hearing due to this. So you give it an attribution, but again, it is oral history. And there's nothing wrong with that because most oral history stories like you say, do have a kernel of truth. In fact, I don't think I've ever had a story that was passed down that I haven't been able to find something that gives it some validation. Often it's twisted a little bit or it's way off, but I see where it came from when I finally figure it out. You know, and that's the other thing is that maybe others heard the story. So I love to send out holiday letters. And when I get a story like this, it's like, now, and my older cousins, did they hear a different variation on that same story? Mm. And then you compare the notes. So you could say, all right, here's my version of the story. But my cousin, Sally, who's 20 years older than me, says the story was as follows. And then put down the source again for that one. She heard it from my grandmother in 1957 while sitting on the front porch. So you take all of those and then you draw a hypothesis. And I'm sure that, you know, it's almost like when you're interviewing people from a crime, each person is going to hear different little facts. In this case, it's the crime of finding an ancestral story and solving it. Interesting. I'm, I'm reading a book right now on memory. And it talks about the fact that we all remember the same things differently, much like the crime situation. So Mm -hmm. to go out and reach out to other people and try to find what more specifics might be added or what other version of the story might be out there. Still, it doesn't mean that it's anything's wrong. It just means you might find a different take on that story and then give it attribution to where it came from. It's no big deal that you don't have a written record of it. That's really how it usually is. One of the things that I like to do is I like to compare the facts with the stories and see if any way they work into the timeline. (laughs) The ones that don't seem to work out are these military stories. Someone says, they were the hero at Gettysburg, and then you find out that they weren't even at Gettysburg. (laughs) They were in a camp hospital in New York that they had gotten sick weeks before. Yeah. So sometimes our stories by our grandparents or great-grandparents handed down can be elaborated to cover up something like maybe they went a wall so it's so funny you say that dave because one of my wife's ancestors was said to have been involved in the boston tea party except mm-hmm. he lived his whole life in virginia and i just don't see how it works Oh, maybe he took a trip up there for the occasion. (laughs) Maybe so. For a cup of tea. So hope that helps, Pam. It's not that big a problem. Just give a little attribution, and we appreciate the question. We have another one coming up for you in three minutes when we return on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show with Ask Us Anything. We're back for our final segment this week of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It is Ask Us Anything. And, uh, David, this is from Roger in Albuquerque. And he says, uh, guys, I'm just getting started in genealogy, and I'm very excited to do it. What tips can you give a beginner? That is a great question. Dave, what say you? 
Well, Roger, I would first ask how old you are. Now, it's not because I'm getting nosy. It's a matter of knowing how many living older relatives you might have. Because when I was a kid, I started in grade school. My grandparents were alive, and I had some great aunts and uncles, and I had older cousins and older cousins of my parents that I asked all sorts of questions of. Now, if you're 80 yourself, that person you're interviewing may be you or maybe a sibling. Mm -hmm. um, you really want to start with your basic knowledge. It's just like anything. Start with what you know and start working back. Obviously, you're going to know some common things. You're probably going to know your father and your mother's name. You're going to probably know your grandparents. Now, some people don't know their grandmother's maiden name or their full name of their grandfather, or maybe not what country their ancestor came from, or maybe not what county in Ireland. But that's where you start. I mean, you start filling out that family tree and you start to see the blanks. And that's where we edge forward. I've, I've been edging forward for 45 plus years now, <laughs> and I'm still working on it because it's never done. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're right on it, David. If you start interviewing the old folks now, we used to have a joke, my wife and I, because we started in our 20s. And mm -hmm. every time we would go interview somebody within a year or so, they were gone. And so we, <laughs> we came to realize that our interviews were kind of the kiss of death for these people. <laughs> but, oh, no. oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were gone and it happened yeah. over and over and over again. But we felt like they were being preserved for us just so we could get the stories before they could be let go. In fact, one of them had had one of those near death experiences and was told she needed to go back. And she said, what for? I don't have anything. I thought, well, it was to talk to us so we could get these <laughs> stories and pictures. I'm starting to wonder if people stopped answering your calls. Hey, I'd like to come over and interview. No, no, no. I want to live. No, no, they did not do that. You know, oh. it's just the way it worked out. But it is really important to do that. And anybody who might even be a little more distant, a cousin to your parents, like you talked about, sometimes yeah. those are the folks that have a whole different take on different questions you might have. And maybe they have letters that your side of the family sent to their side of the family with some news you know, in there. That's fantastic. And the other thing is, Roger, do the fan approach. That's family, associates, and neighbors. So obviously we know about family, but associates. Maybe your dad's not alive anymore, but his best friend is, and went to school with him, was in the service with him. Yep. Or maybe a neighbor of your mom who was a little older and she babysat, so she would have even known your grandmother and grandfather. Birth, marriage, and death records give us the facts. We want the stories as family historians. Exactly. But you do want to start with that tree so you can see which stories you're going for, which branches mm -hmm. you want to work on. And make sure, too, that you document everything you do. I mean, from the start, I think most of us aren't very good at documenting when we're just getting started. We write it down. We take it for face value. We don't think about it. And then years later, we go back and go, oh, where, where did I get that? Mm -hmm. Did you I, ever do that, Dave? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, and that's okay because I used to think that, well, it was expensive to do the title page as a photocopy, so I'd write the information on the back of the page. Ah. Sometimes I'd forget, and I'd just have the page of my ancestor came and say, well, no, page 56, where's this from? I mean, now we can Google it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It. It's but, a lot uh, easier. Not back then. <laughs> no, that's really true. Great question, Roger. Welcome to the game, and we're excited for you and wish you the best of luck in finding the stories you're looking for. David, thanks so much for coming on. We'll talk to you again next week. All right, my friend. All right, and thank you for joining us. If you missed any of the show or you want to catch it again, it's easy to do. Listen to the podcast on all the usual places, Spotify, Apple Media, iHeartRadio, ExtremeGenes.com, TuneIn Radio. We are all over the place. Talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Thank you.